Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After what can only be described as an absolute eternity, NASA's SLS finally fired up its engines and left the pad. Yeah, this was late last night for me. I, I just kind of did a little uh, Twitch live stream party while we just talked about this, answered questions. We had hundreds of people viewing. It was fantastic. It was very exciting to see. Yeah, this is it. Uh, after all these years, this is a journey which started back, what, in 2005 for the Orion spacecraft and the uh, the rest of it, you know, of course, was originally going to be Constellation and then it was reimagined in 2010 to make it more affordable as SLS. There are parts of this rocket that date further back than that. Those main engines are all from the space shuttle. Some of them flew uh, as, early, as early as 1999. And segments of those solid rocket motors, some of them date to the 1980s. And those five-segment solid rocket motors can now claim to be the most powerful rocket motors ever flown. These boosters are about 20% larger than their equivalent space shuttle boosters. And because solid rocket motors have so much particulate matter in their exhaust, they put out a lot of light. That means that this rocket launch is the brightest rocket launch ever carried out. Uh, well, except for maybe the N1 that exploded. This truly turned night into day over Florida for a few minutes before those solid rocket motors finally separated. And at this point, I want to switch over from the official video to Red Rhetoric. He captured it using a Nikon P1000 with its monster long zoom lens. And here, we just really get to see the stage separation in staggering detail. What I really love here about those boosters is the white smoke, the very low density stuff getting blown backwards, whereas the heavy sparks, those continue forwards. So you've got almost like a comet with two different tails effect. Yeah, that's those two boosters going out in style. Previously, those booster segments would have uh, been parachuted into the ocean and then recovered. But that is it. That is their end. They are came down in the ocean and presumably have sank to the bottom of the Atlantic now. I also want to share John Krause's shot of the same event, Frozen in Time. Now, this is a handheld camera shot and he was standing in a specific place because he had a specific image he wanted. And boy, is it a banger. Yes, he got it lined up with the moon, close enough that we can see some serious shockwaves being generated by this. This is, of course, the crackle from the rocket causing multiple uh, pressure waves to roll across the moon, making these tears in the bottom. There were, of course, thousands of people all over the area getting photographs of this spectacular event at night. This is another one that uh, stood out. It was a vapor cone forming around the top of the rocket as it moved through Max Q. This is by Trevor Malman, of course. And such a large project had many companies involved. We have official photography from ULA. The remote cameras have yet to come in for the you know private people, but we are starting to see those come in. And the observers weren't just on the ground, of course. We had the Na NASA's WB-57 high-altitude observation plane, and it was downrange, so it was able to track the whole launch for much longer than many of the ground-based cameras as the rocket disappeared downrange. But if we rewind a few hours, there was a time we weren't 100% sure this was going to happen. They had a number of problems during the countdown, perhaps the most spectacular of which was a leaking hydrogen valve. They basically noticed that they, there was helium building up in parts of the launch structure, so they had to send out a team, a red team, right, not red shirts, a red team, to stand next to this giant rocket full of propellant, and their job was to fix the leak by torquing packing nuts. I know you can tell us about crazy things you've done, but uh, torque is cheap. These guys were really packing nuts. Okay, that's terrible. Since we're here with the childish puns, uh, I, we should probably talk about the effects of Hurricane Nicole. One of the things that had been observed was that there were some of the um, room temperature, RTV, room temperature vulcanized rubber, which is used as a sealant, right? This is basically a high-tech caulk that they would, you know, squirt and lay into cracks to basically seal it against weather. And it had become delaminated in a number of places. So, yes, they decided to go ahead and fly with it. And no, I can't figure out how to use the term caulk rocket in a way that is funny and grammatically correct. 
The final problem which did actually delay the launch by a few minutes was a radar system which had an ethernet switch which was not operating correctly. This radar was required for the flight termination system and so they had to swap that thing out and that of course means unplugging everything, plugging it back in and you know updating your configuration and whatnot. But they did actually get that in and they launched just not long past the official opening of the window. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to say the coverage wasn't great. They did actually have some cool people on. It was great to see Kayla Barron on there because, uh, you know, high achieving astronaut type person, submarine warfare expert and like 34 years old, I feel inadequate. But um, we didn't get really great. At, we didn't get any telemetry. We didn't get any numbers telling how fast it was going, how far down range. There were no onboard cameras that were active during the main part of the launch. We only got the onboard cameras once the final stage had terminated and they were in their initial insertion orbit. The cameras we did see operating on orbit are these small GoPros. In fact, I think they're old GoPro 4s. Uh, those are on the end of the solar panels and that gave them like an interesting view because they're far enough out that they can actually look back at the spacecraft. There was a few times I saw what looked like jets of gas or whatever coming off. I, I think that's actually, you know, I was worried for a bit, but then I realized, yeah, it had been sitting out in the rain, uh, in the hurricane. It was probably water that got into places and was evaporating. We also did get to see this this stage, right? The main booster stage. You see it right at the top there? Yeah, we could actually see that hanging around near the spacecraft as it was operating on orbit. The upper stage of the SLS is the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. It's basically the upper stage of a Delta IV. That's powered by an RL-10 engine, and when the engines are firing, they actually fold the solar panels down like this. But you do get these oscillations in the solar panels as the, you know, the uh, rocket engine force onset just causes like a, you know, dr it drives a, an oscillation in those panels. They had to perform two burns with the RL-10 engine. The first was to raise the perigee. So initially, the uh, rock, the whole booster practically goes into orbit, but the orbit has a perigee of about 40 kilometers over the Pacific Ocean, so that when it comes around again, it re-enters. But to stop that happening to the capsule so that it can go to the moon, they have to raise the orbit. So it would do that over the Pacific, and then about 20 minutes later, it actually began its burn to head out to the moon, the translunar injection moon, which will take it to the moon. And from there, it will actually go into a distant retrograde orbit for a couple of weeks before coming back to Earth. Now, after those two burns are complete and about you know, almost two hours into the mission, that stage is now dropped. Uh, now, that stage, is, is mission isn't over at this point. It has a number of CubeSats on board inside that fairing, and those are going to be jettisoned. The one I'm most interested in there is NEA Scout, which is going to deploy. It's got a solar sail that it will extend, and it will use that to propel itself to visit an asteroid. So I'm really looking forward to that. After it's deployed those, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, it will then perform one other burn of its engine, and that will put it into a different orbit to make sure it comes nowhere near Orion as it's performing its uh, you know, encounter with the moon. So now this is the largest and heaviest spacecraft that has been launched this far into space for like almost 50 years. To get to the moon, it still needs to perform some trajectory correction burns. Actually, we had one of those this morning. So the service module has uh, a, its own engine and propulsion. The engine, of course, on that is an AJ-10 engine that was originally used on the space shuttle. It like it literally flew on a space shuttle. That's a bipropellant, you know, hydrazine and uh, monomethyl hydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide. Again, when that engine fires the solar panels deliberately fold back to reduce the stress on the hinges and we see the panels moving as the you know as the force is applied to them so for the next few weeks the engineers will be checking out all the systems one of the systems i'm personally interested in is that callisto box right in the middle because that big screen that is basically a 12.9 inch ipad pro which has been just integrated into the console so that they can talk to the spacecraft remotely, obviously, because there's nobody on board. Uh, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that survives. But for now, it's great to look back on where we've come from and look forward to the spacecraft's encounter with the moon and its return to Earth on December 9th. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.